I'm a PhD student at Kilimanjaro Quantum Tech in Barcelona, and I'll be talking about a quantum annealing algorithm for the qubit allocation problem. And this is joint work with Artur García Saez and Marta Estarellas. So first, I don't know how many of you uh, may be familiar with the qubit allocation problem. I'm guessing many of you. <laughs> Uh, it's also known as the qubit routing problem, and it's a problem that comes up in the compilation process of gate-based quantum computing. So we have a user that defines a quantum circuit that they want to run on some gate-based so, uh, hardware. And they, they would define this quantum circuit in some algorithmic qubits, which are logical qubits, and uh, this quantum circuit will be, uh, will consist in a instruction set that will be a list, an ordered list of uh, links to be performed um, on each layer of the circuit. So here we are imagining that we are forgetting about the, the single qubit gates since we are dealing with connectivity issues, uh, as you will see in a moment, and we are only considering the two qubit gates of this uh, circuit that was sent by the, by the user. So we have this instruction set gamma, that is this ordered list of uh, links to be performed at each layer. And uh, on the other hand, we have our hardware connectivity, which is not uh, all to all, but limited, as you would see this omega here as a simple example. And uh, the question comes, okay, I do not have all to all connectivity in my device, but m most likely this uh, gate-based circuit that I have just received will require this all to all connectivity. How, how do I get around this? And this is a problem that already the devices that we have have to face, obviously. So the way that one would go about this is to introduce extra gates that uh, allow us to implement this connectivity at the cost of, well, having a deeper circuit, basically, with all that it entails. So we have two types of transformations in order to do this. We have the possibility of, uh, of introducing swap gates, which uh, what they do is, um, let the algorithmic qubits migrate around their physical allocations in the hardware device. That way we can bring uh, closer together the two qubits that we need to interact. And then we have the, also the possibility of implementing a bridge gate, which uh, allows us to uh, connect two qubits that are uh, separated by only, by only at distance one. And uh, in this case, the algorithmic qubits stay put in their respective physical sites. So, um, as I already said, this introducing uh, further gates uh, deepens our circuit. You already know the drill, more ledgers, longer computation, increased error. We don't like this. So we would like to find the optimal solution to this problem, basically. And well, what you see here on the upper right would just be like the, uh, a good solution to the toy problem that we were using to explain this. So uh, the way that we usually go about this now is uh, by heuristics. Uh, qubit allocation is an empty complete problem, so this is uh, basically the way to go. <laughs> and these heuristics usually consist of two parts. You need to find an initial allocation to start uh, building your uh, algorithm, well, to start building a set of transformations that you uh, basically propagate from this initial allocation in the hopes of it uh, having a, a low cost at the end, such that uh, the connectivity required at each uh, step of the, uh, at each layer of the circuit is satisfied. So let me stress here that the actual solution to qubit allocation, to a qubit allocation instance, is this initial mapping, this initial algorithmic to physical qubit mapping, plus the set of transformations that is derived from it, such that the connectivity is satisfied at all times. All right, um, I think I'm leaving something here. It will come up, okay. So what we'll uh, actually concern ourselves with is uh, finding the initial allocation. Ah, right, <laughs> this is what I left. So this final initial allocation is usually found also by heuristic methods. And what we are proposing is an algorithm to find this initial allocation such that uh, it belongs to the truly optimal path. What I have here. So uh, let me define a bit of uh, the terminology of uh, what you can see here. So we are going to find the final, parenthesis initial, I'll explain that in a second, configuration corresponding to the optimal path. Okay, every time I say configuration, I actually mean algorithmic to physical qubit mapping, which is really long to pronounce, so I'll probably just use configuration. Um, and then when I say path, I mean the ordered set of configurations corresponding to the optimal sequence of transformations that is actually the solution to the qubit allocation problem. Uh, so 
by providing this uh, starting point uh, for the for the Kivita, uh, for this heuristic algorithms to build up the set of transformations, uh, we are well, uh, providing with the possibility of actually attaining the the optimal solution, which is not guaranteed at all, and also enhancing the probability of finding better solutions in general. So in general, this problem is highly dependent on the initial mapping that you choose as well. So um, our algorithm, the general idea is inspired by Aharonov's construction of the proof of universality of adiabatic quantum computation, which uh, most of you may have read at some point, uh, but I will quickly review just to refresh our memories and for those who haven't. So this, um, this proof is based on the history state that was uh, built by, by Kitaev previously, which basically um, contains the states of uh, gate-based quantum computation at all times of the, of the computation. So how is this done? Basically, the, the qubit register is separated into two parts, a clock register and then a, another algorithmic register that is actually containing the, the quantum state that would be present in the gate-based system. And then this uh, clock register is just a unary encoding uh, to, to encode the circuit layers that we're going to be considering. And uh, how this, um, and it's an equal superposition of all of those, all the states that the quantum circuit goes through throughout the, the program. So the, this history state is the, Hamilton, is the ground state of this H final uh, Hamiltonian that you see over here. So this H clock is just a, a term that is implementing the constraints for the clock register to stay unary. Basically, uh, this uh, H input is simply implementing the initial state of the gate-based quantum computation. Uh, and uh, what uh, is particularly interesting is this HL over here that is um, the one uh, providing this propagation of the computation uh, in the, that is now, that is afterwards present in the, in the ground state. And as you can see, it consists of uh, the sum of terms that implement each of the unitaries corresponding to the um, unitary describing the operation of each layer uh, with uh, tensor with the advancement of the clock uh, register. So this uh, entanglement that uh, this Hamiltonian creates is what is allowing for this information to be propagated from the initial states of the, comp of the computation to the final states of the computation and that's how you get this uh, superposition over here. So what we are going to do is uh, something sort of similar. Um, so we will uh, intuitively compute uh, simultaneously the analogous history states corresponding to every path, path in the sense uh, that was defined previously. So uh, this analogous here is quite um, broad because here in this case, we are weighing, weighing each transformation by its corresponding cost. And this is actually the way in which we're going to implement the cost function that we would like to have. Uh, and yeah, you can um, think of this maybe, if it helps, uh, as a, um, the scheme that we just saw with uh, the perfect uh, simulation of gate-based computation. If you had noisy channels, then your, your states would be propagating all over and you would simply be following the, the um, effect of the unitaries in all the um, states that are um, being propagated by the noisy channels. So uh, in this case, our ground state would look, um, well, something like that, which is more complicated than what we had, but what you're gonna do? <laughs> uh, and basically, we will have um, to each clock state, uh, we will have associated a superposition of all the uh, possible configurations that uh, we may have, so all the algorithmic to physical qubit mappings, remember? And uh, we will be particularly interested in what we have at the final stage of the computation. Oh, okay, I'll go back to that. Um, so uh, in order to do this, what we will do is just directly bias this uh, final final uh, state in the clock register such that we concentrate the probability of our wave function over there in the ground state. Uh, so this uh, VLV will be uh, greater and hopefully much greater than the rest. And then once we have, uh, once we look at the configuration um, states associated to that time, the one that has the maximum probability would correspond to the configuration at the optimal path uh, at this final time uh, of the algorithm. I think I didn't say it before, 
I just realized, so this initial inter, uh, between parentheses <laughs> that I promised that I would explain I, and I didn't, <laughs> it's just uh, that you can use this algorithm to find either the final or the initial configuration by simply reversing your instructions and what you define your algorithm. Uh, so that's why I, I'll, I'll say final all the time in the interest of time ordering, but just know that it can be both. Um, okay, so this would be a schematic picture of uh, the algorithm that I just described. Basically, uh, it is uh, the Hamiltonian transition elements uh, corresponding to the well, analogous to the HL that we saw previously that I'll uh, explain a bit in, in more detail uh, in a sec. Uh, the ones that are implementing this cost function. So uh, this transition element elements will be inversely proportional to the distance covered by the transformations that we need to implement and directly proportional to the gate fidelity, which is also an important uh, aspect that we would like to take into account. So uh, here, as you can see, we will have that uh, for each uh, time step, which uh, is also corresponds to each layer. We have uh, each of the nodes would be a configuration that is uh, algorithmic to physical qubit allocation mapping. Um, and we see that the lines connecting uh, configurations at different time steps have different thicknesses. And this would be this, this uh, transition amplitudes. And the just thicker lines correspond to cheaper transformations, uh, narrower lines correspond to more expensive transformations. And uh, the optimal path will be defined only by the end of the instruction set. Um, this is because it's not, um, if uh, you are going through your instruction set that has, uh, I don't know, 10 layers, when you're at the fifth layer, the optimal solution corresponding to just going through the fifth layer is not necessarily the one that uh, will be optimal when you look at the 10th layer, if you follow that path. Uh, so. Uh, let's take a look at um, the uh, register encoding that we are proposing. So not much uh, special to see here. Clock register is still unary, as in uh, Hanonov's approach, and the algorithmic register is uh, also fairly standard in its encoding. So we will have uh, NH subblocks uh, within this algorithmic register, NH being the number of hardware qubits uh, that we have in, in our physical device. And um, Within each sub-block, we have NV plus one uh, slots uh, to allocate our qubits, and these NV refer to the number of algorithmic qubits that are present in the, in the program that we want to uh, encode in our quantum gate-based device. And this plus one is in case we have uh, NH larger, larger than NV, so that we allow for the possibility of uh, physical sites to remain empty. So uh, the enforcement of um, the restriction to the physically meaningful uh, state within this encoding is uh, fairly standard again. So this um, term that you have down here is just a, a term uh, penalizing everything that goes out of the unary encoding. And then what we have up here is the, the way to uh, enforce the constraints that make this uh, encoding make sense. So. Um, Additionally, we would like for all the states that we encounter to, well, we require, it's not that we would like, <laughs> to uh, respect the hardware connectivity of our hardware device. That, that was the point. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we, we would uh, like to implement this as part of our uh, constraints in order to have our algorithm be more efficient. So we're gonna do that. We're just gonna introduce this additional constraint in the initial and in the final Hamiltonian. So with this, uh, our final Hamiltonian would look like this. We have, uh, it's, it's fairly analogous to, to uh, the universality proof uh, ham initial Hamiltonian as well. So we have this uh, H clock initial that initializes the clock at t equals zero. We have this uh, constraints that I just described and then we have this mixing Hamiltonian that creates an equal superposition of uh, the states uh, of the computation. So, well, basically in the end we have that this ground state should be a superposition of the states that we want to have, so the, the ones that have physical meaning. Note, by the way, that the ground state of this Hamiltonian is not trivial at all to prepare. So you would have to actually optimize an annealing process in order to reach uh, the preparation, the proper preparation of this ground state. The nice thing is that you only need to do it once, right? So that's uh, not a worrisome overhead, I think. I mean, not the most worrisome overhead. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the final Hamiltonian, uh, in this case, we finally got to it. So we have this H clock final, that is the one that is going to bias us uh, towards the final uh, state 
of the instruction step of the instruction set um, with this simple term over here. Then again, we have the constraints and we have this H transformations, which is the one inducing the implementation of the cost function. So within this H transformations, we have uh, three blocks, well, three types of terms. Uh, we have this HV, which is the one implementing the bridge transformations that I described earlier. So it implements a bridge transformation and advances the clock. Uh, this HNS, which uh, advances the clock when no transformation is required, that is when the configuration already satisfies the required connectivity at uh, that given layer. And uh, we have this HS over here, which is the most complicated, that implements swaps and advances the clock. So uh, I don't have a lot of time in this talk, so I cannot go into this uh, in detail, so I'll just uh, put the two um, most, uh, the two simplest uh, terms here so that you uh, can see the structure and the logic uh, with which they are built, but uh, do not pay too much attention to me, well, or do, but uh, please do not get distracted by this many formulas in this, <laughs> or this many tiny definitions. Um, so just note, please, that uh, this HNS is already three local, and this HP is already four local. So you can imagine that the swapping term is actually going to be highly non-local and fairly rapidly. So the, the smallest swap needs to be implemented with uh, five uh, local terms in, uh, with this logic, and it explodes uh, really, really fast as we introduce more and more swaps to connect uh, further apart sites. So, um, okay. Um, coming to the end, just let me say that building H transformations also requires uh, classical preprocessing to characterize uh, the cost of the different transformations that we have in our hardware graph, because we want to first uh, identify the shortest paths between uh, the different physical sites and also take into account the gate uh, quality. So we, we need to make a, a thorough analysis of what we have in our hardware. On the other hand, this is something that makes sense with the problem that we are tackling with. So we wouldn't expect not to have to do this. All right, so let me finish uh, saying that we have provided an algorithm that gives a final or an initial, or and an initial um, algorithmic to physical qubit mapping for the qubit allocation problem corresponding to the exact solution. Uh, this is done by explicitly exploiting the, the entanglement between the uh, configuration and clock register qubits. And uh, also there's this possibility of uh, taking this uh, little step, step further and building an iterative algorithm that allows us to find some more configurations uh, at the initial and final stages. And uh, also we are uh, in the lookout and thinking about um, problems with a similar structure that may be formulated in this manner as well. Thank you. There are questions? Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, could you clarify exactly how many qubits this would need? Like, I assume it's a yes. function of the number of qubits in the circuit and also the circuit depth, I would guess. Um, Yes, so this would be uh, NH times NV plus 1 plus LV. LV, sorry, I haven't said it. It's the depth of the circuit. Yeah, it's important, sorry. <laughs> it's linear in the, in the depth of the circuit. Yes. I have a question uh, that's in the chat. Um, okay. Have you tried, um, have you considered implementing this on a quantum annealing system? I kind of think it might be, uh, uh, there might be a lot of problem blow up, but it may not fit on, you know, an interesting problem may not fit on current size chips, but maybe you could use a, a hybrid approach, you know, that could read l much larger cubos. Uh, the thing is that it is, very highly non-local, so I, I really haven't thought about the, the possibility of implementing it right now. I, I wouldn't know how to make it fit anywhere, to be honest. It's the, the swapping terms, uh, so I can maybe... Uh, wait, let's see. Yes. So... Um, yeah, this gets messy really fast, basically. Just for L equal three, 
you have, um, it's not just that the interactions when you are thinking about implementing uh, long distance swaps are highly non-local, is that you have uh, to consider all the possibilities that uh, come up within this, uh, this long range interaction. So you would be, have to be reducing the order of many terms uh, that are highly non-local, which is further going to uh, increase the number of extra qubits that you will need to do this rapidly. So maybe you could use a gate model approach to reduce the size of the, the Hamiltonian for the quantum annealing approach. <laughs> that was a joke. Um, or, but maybe a, maybe a hybrid method, you know, it would be interesting to maybe try this out on a classical quantum system that's big enough to implement it, so. Maybe, I, I haven't thought about it. So I, um, I actually do have, um, I've tried to simulate this uh, myself on my computer, as you can guess, this uh, scales terribly. So I only got to like size four and uh, depth yeah. 13. <laughs> but uh, you do get the solution, but uh, you cannot go much further because this. Right. Uh, Thank you. You're Thank you. Is there any other question here or from the chat? If not, uh, thanks, Anna. Thank you, Anna, again. <laughs>